Good afternoon, Grade Twelves. Welcome back to Hospitality Studies. My name is Mpume Zulu, and today's lesson is on wine. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to demonstrate knowledge and understanding of alcoholic beverages, how they are presented, and how they are served. Wine is defined as an alcoholic beverage that is made by fermenting the juice of fresh grapes. Now, these are not the ordinary grapes that you'll find in your fridge at home or you would find in a supermarket. These grapes are specifically grown to make wine. Guests in the restaurant will ask for advice about which wines, wines are suitable to accompany their meal. Therefore, the knowledge, of, uh, the knowledge of different types of wine is important so that you are able to um, suggest uh, the appropriate wines that the guest can accompany um, the particular dish. Or if the guest is having a function in your establishment, um, the type of wines that are suitable for the meal. Wine is not only the result of the fermentation of grape juice, but it is a combination of many factors. And the most important element in winemaking is the grape itself. The grape will determine what type uh, of, of, of flavor it will have, the sweetness, the acidity, as well as the tannins. We will now look at the classification. You have first, your first classification are your still wines, and they are sometimes called natural wines, your sparkling wines, non-alcoholic, de-alcoholized, low-alcohol, alcohol-free wines, as well as fortified wines. Let's look at still wines first. Now, these are wines that have no bubbles. They are also referred to as your table wines. Nothing has been added during the fermentation process. Now, each and every wine is, will differ, like I said to you before, on the flavor, on the sweetness, on the tannins, as well as the color, because of the different grapes that are used. And the type of grape that you use is called a cultivar and can sometimes be called a grape variety. Now, the cultivar is the wine grape variety that is the building block in the winemaking process. Now, each grape variety has been selected specifically to be cultivated to make that particular wine. So the main difference between the, color, the cultivars is the color of the grapes um, in the making of the white wine, the red wine, as well as the rosé wines. Let us look at the wine making process. The grapes are firstly harvested. After they are harvested, the grapes are destemmed, so they remove the stem and then they crush. They crush the grapes to create what we call a must. And a must is the grape juice before the before it is fermented. Then they are pressed. If you are making white wine, the juice is separated from the skins because white wine has got that golden pale color. And if you are making red wine, you will leave the skins after pressing because the skins contribute to the color of the wine. That deep um, red color is, is a contribution of the skins that are left. Thereafter, the wine will be fermented. Fermentation is when sugar is converted into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Thereafter, some wines will go through blending. Blending is when you combine different grape varieties to make one wine. And it's not all wines that will be blended. Thereafter, the wine will be clarified. It goes through a process called clarification. Now, this process is very, very important because as you are harvesting, as you are um, making the must and you're pressing um, um, the wine and the grape juice and you're fermenting it, you might get foreign matter or we call it um, insoluble materials that you do not need. So you have to remove them. And it is very important to remove these um, insoluble matters because if you don't, the wine will become cloudy as well as um, it will have a dull appearance. Thereafter, the wine is bottled 
and then it is labeled and sealed. Um, it can be sealed off with a cork, or nowadays they seal it with the twist um, cap on, and then it is ready to go into the market to be sold. Okay, let us first look at our first still wine, which is our white wine. Light-skinned grapes are used and these grapes vary from being pale green to gold in color. You can have white wine that is made using green or black grapes. If you are using black grapes it is important that the skin is removed before crushing because you are making a white wine and you want it to have that very golden color. So removing the, the skins um, is very important if you are using black grapes. Depending on um, the type of grape as well as the sugar content, wine is, is classified once it's bottled and it's ready to go into the market or, or, or during the making process, you as the winemaker will determine whether you want to produce a very dry wine, a dry wine, a semi-sweet wine or a sweet wine. Now, boys and girls, let's look at the different cultivars. Said that another name for cultivar is a grape variety. Now, different grapes produce different wines, and these are the different types of cultivars or types of grapes that they use. It is your Chenin Blanc, your Sauvignon Blanc, your Rhine Riesling, your Chardonnay, Gewurz Tramanier, Paul Riesling, and Columbar. Now, it is important that you know these cultivars because in an examination or in a question paper, they can either give you a, a wine bottle with, this, with one of these cultivars and you'll be, and you would have to, for example, identify what type of wine it is. Or if they also in an exam can give an example of dishes and they will ask you, determine whether the wine is suitable for this dish. So you need to have an understanding and know what is a Chardonnay Blanc. It is a white wine cultivar. Okay. The next one is our red wines, which still forms part of our still wines. Um, red wine is usually dry. It is produced in wooded or unwooded styles. So sometimes they can use tanks to make the to make the red wine. But ideally, wooded tanks are um, or wooded um, they call them barrels are used because they also give that nice oaky, um, woody taste to wine. Red wine is made using black grapes and the skin remains through the fermentation process. The skin is only removed during the clarification. Okay, and that's why the wine has got the deep red color. It is because of the skins. And it's also got quite a strong tannin as well. And the skins are, are a contribution to that. Just like white wine, um, uh, you can have um, the red wine having a single cultivar, or you can blend it, um, you can blend two types of grape varieties. Okay, just like white wine as well, you've got the different types of grapes that you can use, and they are your Cabernet Sauvignon, your Merlot, your Pinotage, your Shiraz, your Cabernet Franc, your Pinot Noir, and your Sensoir. Again, like I mentioned with the white wine, it is important that you know at least three or four of these um, cultivars because they can be posed um, in a question paper. You will never be asked um, what is a mellow uh, to give a definition of the type of grape it is, but you will be, for example, uh, asked is it a red or is it a white wine cultivar and um, the types of food that you would um that will pay well with the type of cultivar, okay? The last of the still or natural wines is your rosé wine. This is a nice blushy pink um, type of wine um, that can be dry, off dry, or semi-sweet. It is made from red grapes, and the skins are removed from the juice as soon as the rosy, pinky, blushy color appears. Okay, so it will not have the skins right through until um, the time of blending or clarification. The moment you start getting the color, you will definitely remove the skins. Sometimes, or in some people, make rosé wines by blending your red and white wine together.
Okay, let's move into our second classification. These are sparkling wines. These are wines with large carbon dioxide bubbles. You know sparkling wines, they, it is, it's a celebratory drink. It is um, mostly used in, in, in functions or if it's a birthday party at home. And you know that it is, it is quite a very common type of wine. Um, and people love it because of the carbon dioxide bubbles, which the still or natural wines don't have. Um, it is carbonated by fermentation and in some cases um, by the insertion, insertion of carbon dioxide, which will create the bubbles. When making sparkling wine, I think it's important that I need to also just mention to you that in South Africa, we use the, the term sparkling wines and not champagne. Champagne is made in a French region called Boudoir. In France, in South Africa, it is called sparkling wine. And sparkling wine is made by different methods, um, for example, the Charmat or the tank method, um, the carbonation method, and the method Cup Classique. Now, the Charmat method is when the second fermentation happens in the tank. So it goes through two fermentation to develop that carbonation or the carbon dioxide, the bubbles in the wine. Um, carbon carbonation is when the carbon dioxide is injected into the wine. And then the, the, the cap classique or the method cap classique is when second fermentation occurs inside the bottle. So this one is quite special because first you have your normal fermentation, just like when you are making wine, and then the wine is bottled, and then the second fermentation happens inside the bottle. There are different degrees of sweetness. So if you go out into the shops and you're buying your sparkling wine, um, you've got different degrees of sweetness depending uh, on your palate. Um, you can have it as a brute, which means very dry. Um, sparkling wine can be thick, which means dry, demi-sec, medium dry or slightly sweet, or dough, which is sweet, or depending on your own preferences. And you'll normally find these degrees of sweetness um, on the front of the label, um, they will be there. Now, again, these are very, very important, and you'll normally find them in your section A, where um, they will ask you what is the meaning um, of, of them. Okay. Then you've got your alcohol-free, your de-alcoholized, and your low-alcohol wine. Um, it is made the same way as you would make the normal wine. The difference is that the alcohol is removed just before bottling. Okay. And alcohol free wine is very popular amongst pregnant women, um, amongst people that are taking medication or people that just don't want to, um, to drink any alcoholic beverages, but still like the taste of wine. Okay, and alcohol-free wines is basically the grape juice concentrates um, that is mixed with the grape juice, and it is unfermented. De-alcoholized wines, this is when they've removed the alcohol. There's normally about 0 0.5 alcohol in the wine, um, so it's still got the, uh, a little bit of alcohol, but not like a normal bottle of wine, which will have maybe 14% alcohol. And you'll see in the shops, I'm sure I've put a bottle here for you, um, they do write it if it's de-alcoholized, and then as well as this one, which is um, alcohol free. But you'll see here, it does have a grape variety, which is your Cabernet Sauvignon, um, which is a red grape variety, but it's got no alcohol or the alcohol has been removed. Okay, now we move on to our last category of, of, of classifications of wine, which is our fortified wines. These are wines that are non-sparkling, so they've got no carbon dioxide in them whatsoever. The wines, um, it is wines in which spirits are added. So they take a normal wine, just like you make your white wine or your red wine, and then they add a wine spirit. So it is fortified. There's an addition of something, and that something is a spirit. Fermentation is stopped by the addition of the spirit, so it will not go through the whole process like you're making the wine. Um, when they add the spirit, then fermentation immediately stops. 
and you've got two types of um, fortified wines that we discuss in grade 12. There are many others, but we only look at sherry as well as port. You will understand as we go through the lesson where they will link, especially when it comes to the pairing um, of food. So that is how you would um, incorporate them um, into your responses in a question. Okay, now let's look at the wine label. Okay, because remember we said that each wine has got its own or it's or it's got different grapes that are used, different cultivars. So the wine label um, is also would have to have that dif those different types of cultivars. The wines are made by different wine farms, different um, different places. They have different places of origin and um, etc. So let us look at the wine label, which is very, very important. Um, we'll look at the front of the label first. Now, you need to pay attention here, boys and girls, because um, this is quite a common question that they will ask um, in the examination. Okay, so in this instance, I've got a, a white, a red wine um, bottle, which will have a label in the front and a label at the back. But we'll start off with the front of the label. If you read this one, it says Levile's Winery. It's a Merlot 2019. Robertson's 14% alcohol, 750 mils. So now what does all of these, all, all of this information that's on the label mean? Okay, Levile's Winery is the producer. That's the wine farm that has um, that has planted or, 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 or cultivated the grapes. They are the ones that are making this bottle of wine. So it's a red wine. Merlot is the cultivar. It is the type of grape that has been used. 2019 is the vintage. It is the year in which the grapes were harvested. Let me make an example. If, for example, the wine like this one is a 2019, that means that in 2019, the grapes were picked from the vineyard. Okay, and then the wine is 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 then crushed and they pressed and it's fermented and you, and you have your wine in the end. Even though this type of wine will only be available in the shops in 2020, but the year in which the grapes were harvested is the name of the vintage. Robertson is the origin. This is where this wine is made. So Levile's winery, the producer of the wine, is located in, in Robertson, which is in the Western Cape. 14% alcohol just tells you the alcohol content of the wine. 750 mils tells you the volume. Okay, because you've got different types. You've got even the small ones that you'll find in an airplane, which are about 375 mils. So the volume of the wine is very important. On the neck of the bottle, as you've seen the arrow there, you have what we call the authenticity seal. This is found in all the bottles of wine, and it basically certifies that Whatever is in the contents is actually true. So the grape that has been used in this particular wine is a Merlot. So this uh, seal basically confirms it that it is true. And um, this authenticity, uh, authenticity seal um, is given out by the Wine and Spirit Board. Okay, let's look at the back of the label now. It's the same wine, but we're looking at the back. Okay, at the back of the label, you'll find information that says Leville's Winery, a Merlot, plum flavors, touch of oak and chocolate. And the moment you see the word touch of oak, it shows that this wine was fermented in, um, in oak barrels. The serving suggestion says complements beef roast, pasta and steak. The serving temperature is 16 degrees Celsius. It's got 14% alcohol and it is um, 750 mils. Okay, um, that information there um, means it is the description of 
the wine. So, so you know, you know your palate. What do you like? So, if you like something with plums and chocolate taste and an oaky um, taste, then you will definitely go for this wine. And this information is found at the back of the wine label. Um, you've got your serving suggestion. How would you? Which foods will pair well with this wine? Um, your temperature, what, to, what serving temperature must you have it? So it's 16 degrees because it's a red wine, um, room temperature is very suitable. And then you've got your barcode. Each and every wine bottle must have a, bar, a barcode. Okay. Let us now match the food and wine. Matching food with wine. You need to follow the guidelines. Acidic flavors such as vinegar or lemon need to be matched with acidity. So you will choose a wine with acidity. Your starters will pair well with a dry white wine or a rosé wine. Fish, poultry, which is your chicken, and shellfish pair well with your dry red wine, your dry white wine, sorry. Veal, which is your small calf, and pork, they pair well with your medium white wine. Game meat, which is quite strong, it's got very strong flavors. It com is complemented by your red wine. Rich red wines will pair well with red meat dishes. Your sparkling wine um, is complemented by foods, um, for example, your caviar, your oysters. It's mostly a celebration wine, so you would you would you would consume your sparkling wine with more or less everything, but um, caviar and oysters are the most um, dominant ones. Desserts require sweeter wines, okay, like your port, which is your fortified wine. Cheese blends, um, well with pork and dry red wine. Now port again being your fortified wine. It is important or it is always suggested and recommended that you drink white wine before your red wine because your red wine is quite rich and heavy and your red, your white wine is very light and normally your starters are, are light. So you'll start off with your white wine before you move on to your main course and have your red wine. Um, it is also suggested that you drink your, um, your dry wine before your sweet wine. And then you serve a very good wine before a great wine. So you save the best for last. Okay. Now, there you have, you, you have um, produced all these bottles of wine and you know you've done your label and the front and the back and you know which foods it'll pay well with. Where do you store wine? It is ideally have to be stored in a wine cellar. Now, an underground wine cellar is important because it's got no vibrations, because the vibrations will affect the quality of the wine. The cellar must be free from any dampness or unwanted smells or odors. The ideal temperature in your underground cellar must be between 10 to 16 degrees Celsius. The cellar must be well Ventilated and it must also be very clean, it mustn't be dusty. It is important that you store similar wines together. So you have all your Chardonnays together, even though they are produced by different um, um, wine farms, but you'll store all your Chardonnays together, all your Merlots together, all your Shirazes together. It just also makes um, when you are selecting your wines easier. Wine needs to be rotated regularly and the bottles must be kept on their side as you can see um, right here and that is because you need to make sure that you keep the cork moist okay and it must be swollen because if 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 you're placing it upright especially your red wines then air is going to come in and the wine will become sour so hence you store them um, just um, on, on its side and just it's not flat it'll be just tilted 
Um, sometimes your wine cellar might be full and you'll be forced to store your wine, your wines in boxes. Make sure that your, uh, the arrows on the boxes are facing up so that if you're picking up that box or you're opening the box that you are not going to break the wines. Okay. Now, a beverage list and a wine list. Each and every restaurant um, will have a beverage and wine list, okay? And you know from grade 11 as well as um, your food and beverage service that before um, a guest orders their meal, they will be given a wine or beverage list um, to choose their choice um, of, 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 of beverage before they order their food. Now, this wine list is a selling aid which is compiled by the sommelier. The sommelier knows the types of wine that they have in their cellar um, and then other beverages are also included. It's not only your wines, you will have your non-alcoholic uh, beverages as well, um, as well as aperitifs and your, your spirits as well. Um, your wine list or the beverages on your wine list will be listed in the order in which they may be consumed. Um, so, for example, you will not have your coffee as the first item in your wine list because you'll always have coffee at the end of the meal with your dessert. Um, that was just, just to cite an example. And then uh, each beverage is grouped according to the type of drink. So you have all your red wines together, even though they come from different producers. You have all your white wines together. You have all your different sparkling wines um, and you group them together. So you will not find them um, at different places in your wine list. This is just an example of the um, components of a wine list. Um, you have your aperitifs. These are mostly consumed at the beginning of the meal just to wet the, wet, wet, wet the appetite. You call it wetting the appetite, which means it just opens up your stomach um, just a bit more so that when you are ready to have your meal, um, your fortified wines will be there in the beginning, your mineral waters. Then you have your cocktails. You have your spirits. You have your wine still and sparkling. You have your beers, you have your liqueurs, your speciality coffees, as well as your non-alcoholic drinks. This is just an example of what a, um, a, a wine list will look like. Um, you will maybe be asked in the exam if you can um, give examples of, 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 um, of information that, must, that will be found in a wine list. And you just uh, give any or four of those, depending on how many the question requires you to get. Now, boys and girls, there are different tools that you use um, for the correct service of the wine. You've got your first one, is your ice bucket. And this chill, so which means it keeps cold, the sparkling wines, the white wines, and the rosé wines. Because remember from our previous slide, where we've said that your sparkling wines and your rosés and your white wines must be served at a temperature between 7 to 13 degrees Celsius. So it is kept at this temperature consistently by placing ice into the ice bucket, and this um, stays right next to um, the table. You've got your um, wine opener or your waiter's friend, or it can sometimes be called a cork, a cork screw. And this opens all the wine bottles that have got a cork. You've got your wine cradle. This is only for red wine. Um, and it is once you've poured the red wine for the guest, um, you just place it on the sideboard. Um, it's also, like we said, when we were talking about the different storage of wines, that the wines must be, must be placed tilted. Um, and this allows um, in the red wine for the sediment to settle at the bottom. Because remember, um, in our second to third slide, we spoke about the wine making process and that with the red wine, the skin remains, even though clarification has happened. But the older the wine, the more sediments can occur. So you need to, you don't pour those sediments into the, um, the guest glasses. So placing it at this angle ensures that the sediment stays at the bottom of the bottle. 
okay you've got your wine decanter um this is mostly for your very old vintage wines like i, I mentioned now with the wine cradle where it has a sediment and you are decanting it because you do not want to be serving guest wine with the sediment so you are basically um taking it from the bottle and filtering it into the decanter and you will serve it from the decanter and now and in and, and olden days it used to be so interesting because they used to put a candle um right on the neck of the bottle like that so you can basically know how far to, to pour and when to stop to avoid the sediments from going inside the decanter okay then you've got your service cloth and um, the service cloth is important because it is used to absorb water when the bottle is removed from the wine cooler because remember it's going to be nice and cool there and then when you take it out there's going to be water everywhere so you need to wipe the bottle before you pour or you refill the guest glass um it's also to wipe the neck of the bottle of the guest um before you pour them the first taste of the wine um etc Now, wine is served at different temperatures. That is very, very important. Each wine is different. Um, your natural wines are different. Um, your sparkling wines are different. Um, your 40, 45 wines are different. And you have to use the correct glasses as well. And before you serve use those glasses, you need to ensure that those glasses are actually clean. Okay, your sparkling wine must be served at a temperature between six and eight degrees Celsius. Now, boys and girls, if you write in the exam, you'll find that some textbooks say seven degrees Celsius. It's okay. You can say seven degrees. So whatever is in between six and eight will be the correct answer. White wine must be between 7 to 12 degrees Celsius. Some textbooks will say 7 to 10. That's still correct because it's still within that bracket. Your rosé wine as well is between 7 to 12 degrees Celsius. That is also correct if you write 11 or 9 degrees or, uh, or, or, or 8 degrees. That is also still correct. Your red wine is between 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. Again, whatever um, temperature that you put that is in between 15 and 20, that'll be correct. Um, or you can simply write um, room temperature. That'll also be correct. Okay, this is the glass that they use for sparkling wine. This is your red wine glass. And this is your white wine glass if you can see the white wine glass is a bit smaller than a red wine glass when you are cleaning these glasses you have to rinse them in water you have to polish the glasses by hand you have to shine them by holding over a container of boiling water you steam it and you shine with the with the with the cloth now you need to make sure that the cloth that you use is not the type of cloth that will leave fibers on your glasses because it doesn't uh, also um, uh, look nice and also you don't want the guests to be um, putting their mouth on a glass with um, any cloth fibers on it. And then you, it is ideally um, ideal that you store your glasses right side up or hanging upside down. Okay. Very, very important. Now, boys and girls, um, we are now going to, I'm going to show you two videos. The first video is on the presentation, the opening and the serving of red wine as well as refreshing it. And then the second one um, is on the opening and, and, and the pouring of a sparkling wine. Do enjoy this video. It has been downloaded on YouTube um, and then we'll continue um, as well. Just also just be mindful when you're watching the video on um, the red wine, when they are serving the red wine, how much must the red wine be filled? And we will recap on that one afterwards. Enjoy. Thank you for watching this video. Today we are going to learn how to open and serve a bottle of red wine. Remember that red wine is best served at room temperature. First, present the open wine list to the host. Once the host has made a decision, remove the wine list and go and prepare the order. Collect the bottle of wine from the barman or service area. First, present the unopened bottle to the host. The host will check that it is the correct bottle 
and then indicate that you can open it. Waiters Friends are inexpensive and are available at most supermarkets. The Waiters Friend is made up of a knife, the screw and the lever. This is used to open a bottle of wine with a cork. Within sight of the customer, you will use a Waiters Friend to open the bottle of wine. Cut the capsule under the lip covering the neck of the bottle neatly with the knife attached to the waiter's friend. Once the top has been removed, wipe the top of the bottle with a cloth. Place the tip of the corkscrew in the center of the cork at a 90 degree angle. Straighten and turn clockwise, leaving one or two turns of the screw above the cork. Place the lever on the neck of the bottle and gently pull out the cork. Fold up your waiter's friend and place it in your pocket or apron. Wipe the neck of the bottle. Now pour a small measure of wine into the host glass for him to taste. The host may inspect the wine by looking at its color. He could swirl and sniff to make sure the bouquet is fine and then finally taste it. If it is to his satisfaction, he will indicate to you that it's fine to pour the wine. You always pour wine for ladies at the table first. As this is a red wine, you fill the glass halfway. Then proceed to fill the gentleman's glass. Finally, you return to the host and top up his wine glass and then place the red wine bottle onto the table with the label facing the host and leave your guests to enjoy their wine. When refilling the wine glasses, approach the ladies first. Remember that if someone puts their hand across the glass, it means they do not want any more wine, and move on to the next person. When the bottle is empty, present it to the host and ask if he would like another bottle. If he says no, remove the bottle from the table. Hi, my name's Vince and today I'm just going to correctly run you through how to open a bottle of sparkling. So we start with an icy cold bottle of bubbly. It's important that it's cold not only because it's the best way to drink it, but because it decreases the chance of the cork just popping out at random. So to start with we're going to remove the foil. It's got a little tab on the side here that you'll tear off and get rid of that whole top section. Now for the next section, you want to keep your thumb over the top of the bottle at all times. If for any reason the bubbly is too warm or the cork's dodgy, it could just fly out, hit someone in the eye, so it's better to be safe than sorry. So on the side, you untwist anti-clockwise the wire cage, loosen it up, lift up the bottle of champagne and just tilt it to about a 45 degree angle, and then you want to hang on to the cork and twist the bottle very, very slowly. The noise you want to hear at the end isn't so much a pop as just a little hiss of the gas escaping. So as you get closer towards the end, you're going to feel the pressure and the cork's out. It's safe. It's the best way to do it for your wine because you're not losing all your bubbles with that pop. And then serve it in a champagne flute. You'll find you have to pour it very slowly because it bubbles up like this. And once it settles, it's ready to drink. Enjoy. I hope you've enjoyed the video. And I hope that you've saw the importance um, of the pouring of the uh, red wine, that we pour the red wine halfway in the glass. And um, had we had a video on white wine as well, you would only would pour the white wine to be two thirds full in a glass. OK, boys and girls, let us look at the regulations for serving wine on the premises. There are strict laws that regulate the sale of alcohol to the public. Okay, these laws are governed by the Liquor Act number 59 of 2003. 
This liquor act has got two types of licenses under its wing. It is the on-consumption licenses, which are for hotels, restaurants, pubs, theaters, clubs, etc. This liquor license means that you are allowed to serve liquor with the meal, but you are not allowed to let, to let guests leave with the alcohol from the premises. So when they come in, let's say you have a restaurant or um, you are in a club, um, like a golf club, and the guests are having a meal, they are allowed to order um, any alcoholic beverages. But they are not allowed, whether they finish that bottle of wine, they are not allowed to remove it from the premises. Then you have your off-consumption licenses. These are for liquor stores, your grocery stores, and um, that liquor license basically tells the, the holder to sell alcohol, but um, they may not um, allow any patrons to open or drink the alcohol on the premises. So they are selling the alcohol for the person to take the alcohol and consume it um, elsewhere and not in the premises. Now, certain people are disqualified from attaining um, any liquor licenses. For example, a person who has been in the preceding 10 years been sentenced to an imprisonment. So a person with a, um, a prison sentence um, is not allowed to um, have a liquor license. A person who's been declared insolvent, who's lost all their assets, um, that person is not allowed to have a liquor license. A person who is a minor on the date of application, so a person who's um, under the age of 18, um, a husband and wife of any of the above people that I've just mentioned now. Now, if you have an unconsumption liquor license, the ones that they give to hotels and restaurants and pubs, you are not allowed to serve alcohol to anyone under the age of 18. You need to make sure that there is enough guest toilets for both males and females. You need to also make sure that um, you are serving ordinary meals during which um, time that the alcohol is being served. Now, anybody who does not follow these instructions that are set by the Liquor Act of 1959 of 2003 um, will result in having their license revoked. Okay. Now, boys and girls, that was the end of the session. Let us now look at the type of questions um, that you would be, that you might find, or, or just so you are aware of the type of questioning styles that are used in the section of wine um, in the exam or in a question paper. Um, this has been sourced from different types of um, question papers, and it will be available for you in, in a form of a worksheet on the EC curriculum page um, for you to download and to complete them in class. But let us look at the first example. It says, study the scenario below and answer the questions that follow. The scenario says, you are expecting 10 people for a celebratory lunch at your restaurant. The host agreed to a four-course menu that has the following dishes. A lime-grilled chicken Caesar salad, smoked salmon and caviar, lamb shanks with a tomato olive concassia, cherry turnovers with a macadamia night ice cream. Now, I know that some of you won't have a clue of what these dishes are, so I'm going to advise you to look at the key words here. It is chicken, so this is a chicken dish. Salmon from grade um, 11 and caviar, you learned that these are fish dishes. Lamb shanks, you know that that is red meat from our second lesson. And then ice cream, then you'll know it's dessert. So you're looking at chicken, fish, lamb, and ice cream. That is your four course meal. That's just a tip. Let us look at the questions. It says match each dish in the scenario above with a suitable wine cultivar. So each dish must be matched, okay? And that is four marks, you've got four courses and each one of them would have to have their own um, cultivar. Okay, let's look at the answers. The chicken scissor salad will be a white wine. If you write your Chardonnay or your Chenin Blanc, you will not be marked wrong. 
Smoked salmon and caviar is your champagne. Or sparkling wine, you won't be marked wrong there. Lamb shanks, red wine, or you can give the name of the cultivar um, and say Merlot, your Cabernet Sauvignon, or your Shiraz, you will not be marked wrong there. And then your ice cream is your dessert wine, or your sweet white wine, or your port. So any suitable answer, um, but each one must have, must be matched with its own cultivar. Okay, let's look at the second question, which still refers to the same scenario. So please keep the scenario in mind. It says, advise the restaurant manager on how to store the wine correctly. How must wine be stored? We just covered that. The wine needs to be kept in the dark to avoid damage from any ultraviolet lights. Um, it should be stored in a damp, it should not be stored in a damp location. It must be stored, um, they must be free from any vibration. Um, the bottles should be placed on their sides so that the corks stay moist. It must be rotated on a regular basis. Similar wines must be stored together. Bottles should be packed and stored with the label um, to the top or to the front. Um, the cellar should be clean and well ventilated, and it should be stored upside down in the box. Any four of those um, will um, determine that you get four marks. Okay, so now we move on to the next scenario. Study the wine label below and answer the questions that follow. Now, this is the wine label. I'm sorry, boys and girls, I've had to make it quite small so that we could fit in a question at, at, at the bottom. Demiso is a restaurateur at Khraf Renitz and has visited many countries abroad sourcing wine to bring to his restaurant. Now, let us look at this wine label. It's Ariel 2004. It is a Cabernet Sauvignon. It is a premium de-alcoholized wine. Contains less than one half percent alcohol by volume, um, and um, it is 750 mils. Okay, you've got the back part of it. Um, it says to win a gold medal against wines with alcohol. Um, this area retains all natural, delicate flavors of wine by using cold filtration process to remove the alcohol. Um, please refrigerate after opening, and it's got all the other aspects of the back of the label. The question says, classify the wine above. Remember, beginning, we spoke about the different classifications. So this wine is classified as natural, or you can say still, or you can say red wine. You know it's a red wine because it's a Cabernet Sauvignon, or you can classify it as a de-alcoholized wine, which is another classification. So any two of those because it's not only natural but it's de-alcoholized it's not only still but it's de-alcoholized it's not only a red wine but it is a de-alcoholized wine so you must be able to interpret and 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 and, and unpack your label correctly the second question still referring to the aerial de-alcoholized Cabernet Sauvignon says refer to the wine label and give information on the cultivar what cultivar has been used the answer is a Cabernet Sauvignon. It is a red wine cultivar. Who produced this wine? It is Ariel. The class designated name of the wine? It is a de-alcoholized wine. Okay. Now, let's move to the third scenario. Study the dishes below and identify two suitable and two unsuitable dishes for the wine in 2.1. I'm sorry, it's still referring to the aerial. So out of this aerial label, you need to identify two suitable and two unsuitable dishes. Okay. Okay, so these are the dishes. It is your blini with sour cream and caviar. Um, blini is your savory pancake. So sour cream, you know it goes on top of it, and then it's got the sprinkles of caviar. Fried veal cutlets. Um, veal, we said it's a small calf. Your beef lasagna, and then your prawn cocktail. Okay, those are the dishes. So which dishes are suitable for that aerial Cabernet Sauvignon? It is your beef lasagna. It is your veal. What is unsuitable is your caviar and your prawns because we know that caviar are suitable for your sparkling wines or your champagne and your prawns are suitable for your white wine. But for red wine, it is the red meats and your Cabernet Sauvignon is your red 
y. Next question, determine the procedure that you will follow when presenting the wine to the guest. And you found that now on the video, um, you have to stand on the right hand side of the guest. You have to hold the wine um, with the service cloth. Um, the label must face towards the guest. You have to present the wine to the host while saying the name and the vintage of the wine to confirm that it is actually what the guest has ordered. You have to open the bottle once the guest is satisfied and, and gives you um, the go ahead. And then you must ask the guest permission to fill the temperature of the wine if they wish to do so. This must be in a logical order because you are presenting the wine. So you cannot start with the last one. Um, last point, you must, it, it, it is all a, a sequence. Okay. Dumisa has failed several times to secure a liquor license. Discuss the statement. Now you must, you are asked to give a, dis, a discussion on the disqualifications. Okay. People that aren't allowed or can't um, uh, acquire a liquor license. Dumiso might be failing to secure a liquor license due to the following. In the preceding 10 years, he's been sentenced to, um, to jail for an offence without an option of a fine. He is a rehabilitated insolvent person. He is a minor or under the age of 18 during the time of his application. He is a husband of any of the people above. Or um, the restaurant, his restaurant, Dumita's restaurant, is next to a school, and you cannot grant permission um, to have uh, a shipping or a restaurant that sells alcohol close to school. Boys and girls, that is the end of the lesson. I hope you have learned quite a bit, and um, you will have the activities, like I said, um, available for you on the Eastern Cape Curriculum website. Thank you so much, and I will see you in our next lesson.